truly understand that you love another man. Your heart will no longer be mine. Remember false that you told me little pain when we sat on the hillside to rest. Try to make me believe all them lies that you told when the sun went down in the west. Said I'll never marry no lying man or man just for steed. I'm gonna marry some handsome little man who rose his wheels by steam. Little Pink is a song that was taught to me by Jerry Milnes in Elkins, and it tells the story of uh, a man who is in love with a, a woman, and uh, she only wants an industrial guy, so meaning someone who's maybe working on the trains or something like that, and he's, he, she doesn't want a logger, she doesn't want a miner or anything like that, or a farmer, and so he's frustrated and he's expressing it in that way. Uh, but the way Jerry explained it to me was that uh, it was an allegory for the industrialization of West Virginia as a whole, and sort of this this crossover between industry and rural living and how difficult it was to, to reconcile both of those things in a, in a rapidly changing world. Where the last time I saw my pretty little pen She was standing in the old hall door Crying so, come, come back, honey, please don't go. Come on, little pink, tell me what do you think? You're a long time making up your mind. I used to think you're the prettiest little thing that ever the sun shone on. My name is Kaya Cater and uh, I was born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, and I moved around uh, quite a bit uh, during my childhood. My mom, Tamara Cater, uh, was the executive director of the Ottawa Folk Festival and then the Winnipeg Folk Festival, so I was, you know, uh, trucked along behind. You know, I, I really didn't even have to seek out folk music because it, it was brought to me in such a unique way every summer. You know, we, we would either go to festivals, we went to the Grey Fox Bluegrass Festival when I was starting when I was 11. And uh, and so I would have this life during the school year where I would visit with my friends and, you know, take lessons on classical instruments like the cello and the piano. And then I would get immersed into this world of folk music and bluegrass music and just go deep and go hard. And uh, the Grey Fox uh, Bluegrass Festival actually has a bluegrass academy. And the academy uh, teaches kids starting from the age of eight years old uh, to play, you know, one, four, five classic bluegrass tunes. And, and so I was, you know, the part of that early generation when it was just starting up. And so I think that, you know, I was in the right place at the right time for learning how to play clawhammer banjo. Um, a lot of people ask me why and how because it's, it seems like such an obscure thing, but really I think that it was just an amalgamation of of festival cultures and uh, and generations teaching generations. And so I really feel like folk festivals, more than anything, provide a nexus for generations of people to interact through music.
the banjo has gone from being sort of this relic instrument that your grandpa plays to kind of a hip, you know, a, a hip thing. And you have all of these crossovers, you know, from uh, Africa, uh, West Africa to, you know, Southern Appalachian music to bluegrass. And I think that people are discovering a little bit more the connections. Uh, I recently came back from Gray Fox Bluegrass Festival and um, there was an, a Nepali uh, musician who uh, was playing with uh, Abigail Washburn, who plays the clawhammer banjo and, uh, and sort of that high and lonesome sound. Um, it, it really connected and so you can find you can find the same themes in, in communities and cultures where you wouldn't see a connection anyway. And so Head Trip was really a way to find a connection with another genre of music that maybe seemed quite far away from my own. I sort of strayed as far as I could from Quebecois music because it was so close to home that it didn't feel interesting to me. And uh, in retrospect, I think that Quebec and especially Montreal has such a strong cultural presence and it has an identity and it has a strong identity, both politically and culturally. And, uh, and that was definitely carved into me when I was very young, like I learned how to speak French and, uh, and I communicated in, in another language within, you know, as, a, as, a, as an Anglophone speaking French, you know, in a, in a Francophone area. And I believe that Quebecois people, having gotten to know them quite, quite well, having got to know um, both young and old, um, there's this feeling of trying to preserve your culture in, in a, a context in which it might be eroding. So, I mean, can Canada's history really has been quite oppressive to Francophone communities, both the Acadian communities and uh, the communities in, in Montreal and all over Quebec. And I think that it's, it's the same with communities in Southern Appalachia, where music is such a strong part of your identity that you have to hold on to it somehow and you have to transfer it through generations somehow. And people grow up playing and they don't consider it as, as, a, as a, a tool for performance, but more as a way of life and as a way to decompress and as a way to connect back to who they are deep down and who their ancestors are. And so if you have grandfathers who play, they teach their grandsons and their granddaughters and then they pass it down and down. And I think that if you don't grow up in that sort of context, as an outsider, you, you might find it to be pretty amazing and interesting and, and crazy, but to them it's just normal. And I think that that's definitely a link that I've found in cultures that have been traditionally oppressed is that there's this very conscious decision to hold on to what you have and make sure that your kids know it too and your kids' kids. Je m'en irai au bois jouer, je me roule, roule, guérons là, je m'en vais rouler, un fil à me quenouiller. So here I'm presenting much more traditional versions of my songs, just banjo and voice for the most part. Um, but in the future, I would like to be touring with perhaps a trumpet or an electric guitar or something that will turn this type of music on its ear and contribute to the folk music community, hopefully in an original and a, a genuine way. Estelle Klein uh, is a famous Canadian, uh, and she was uh, the founder of the Mariposa Folk Festival, and arguably the godmother of all folk festivals henceforth in Canada. And uh, she was quoted as saying that you can never really know what folk music is without 
pushing its boundaries. So a lot of people have this idea of folk music as this sort of genre, this singer-songwriter genre, or a string band, or something like that. And, and the idea is that it's far more abstract than that. And you can't pigeonhole it too much because, because then you don't have progress and you don't have evolution. And so my idea with uh, you know branching sort of electric with acoustic is to push it as far as I can while still staying true to the roots of the music. And, you know, if you look at jazz, if you look at hip hop, if you look at R&B, these are all branches of older forms of music that have popularized and, and um, connected with people in their own way. And I think that as soon as I feel limited or I begin to censor myself in my music, I won't evolve as an artist and I don't think that I will be able to affect people as much as if I just let it flow.